Um, I was wondering whether um, the legislation itself has any consequences built into it, because it's one thing to say that these are going to be the new rules and regulations. For example, in um, saying that you're going to standardize um, the insurance plans across um, the whole spectrum, what happens if the insurance companies, for some reason, decide to, together, collude not to do certain kinds of things? So I wondered whether the legislation did have any kind of penalty or consequence for not uh, non-compliance? Well, the legislation walks an interesting line between um, telling people they have to do things and then obviously not completely reinventing the system. So that, for example, uh, th uh, every a, a state has to set up a health insurance exchange, but insurers don't have to sell through that. On the other hand, the only way people will get subsidies from the government is if they buy the coverage through an exchange. So if you're an insurer, the odds that you're going to stay out of the exchange are not high. You know, you will probably come into the exchange. Massachusetts put in place this exact system several years ago, and they and they basically compelled, they wrote into the law that all insurers have to offer a product in the exchange. The federal legislation doesn't do that, but again, because all of the subsidies will be tied to that, it, it will be as good as saying, you know, I, gee, I'd rather not sell any product this year to decide to stay out of the exchange. So it, it's basically more been a question of luring people in by dint of how you set up the construct as opposed to penalties. Um, actually, the insurance community uh, what became the sort of the bad guy and was the black hat, and the administration spent a lot of energy decrying the insurance community. The insurance community was very supportive of the entire package. Um, they really see this, this is the way that they want to go. Most of the people in U.S. health insurance don't like the fact that the system was orchestrated around figuring out who not to cover. You know, they don't, they, most of them went into healthcare because they really do believe healthcare is a good thing. And so moving the model around to being a model where you cover everybody and then you get paid on the basis of managing care was much more appealing to them than getting paid to kick people out. And that's why you've seen the companies, some of the things that the companies were required to do, like, for example, rescissions, which is this thing that it was legal in the United States where you could sell coverage to somebody and then if they started to incur claims, you could rescind the policy. And all, usually it was claimed that the, that, the, that the insured person had made some fraudulent, uh, had filled out the medical history fraudulently or what have you. Well, my, I have a sister who unfortunately is suffering from advanced lung cancer and her was diagnosed in January and sure enough, the, right after she was diagnosed, her insurance company called up and was about to cancel a policy. So uh, they, don't they actually don't like doing that. <laughs> you know, they're, they're human beings too. They wanted to get to a new world and so this notion of a bigger universe where people are mandated to have coverage and then the insurers are paid really more to manage care over time is really the place that they wanted to go. So I think they look at these provisions as opportunities for them to do business differently, not so much as things that they don't inherently want to do. And uh, that coupled with the fact that, as I said a moment ago, the money flows in this direction is going to be a very powerful set of incentives to get them to do what they need to do. You've also, though, got elections coming up, and as we all know, the GOP is so polarized in its viewpoint. I'm just wondering if you could speculate a little bit as to what you think it would take to get the Republicans on side with these upcoming elections down the road to maybe find a middle ground to say, yeah, maybe this isn't such a bad idea. I mean, to us, it seems so obvious up here, for most right. of us anyway. Right. Uh, how about that speculation? I you know, it's, it's a fascinating question, and I, I obviously have a, no, a number of friends and contacts who are Republicans, and it is, um, it, it's fascinating to see the party sort of go off the cliff on this, uh, and having decided so, uh, so clearly that the direction is to just completely trash the plan and call it, you know, you, th this is a complicated piece of legislation, obviously. Uh, it, it ha you can have a Rashomon phenomenon where people look at it and see different things, uh, but to basically sort of universally trash it is unconscionable. 
they're truly unconscionable, particularly if you, you know, if, if being a Republican was, or, and hopefully still is, all about, you know, effective use of resources and efficiency and uh, maximizing the private market where possible. Well, this legislation does that. It basically shores up the private market. We shored up employer-provided coverage. Now, granted, we expanded Medicaid, but you know, last time I checked, markets don't work well for people who don't have any money. You know? So you make the market work where it can, and then you have the other systems where it can't. So, and, and truly, uh, Republicans who are now out of office, like Bill Frist, the former majority leader of the Senate, they're sort of dumbfounded that the party has basically decided that it, everything is, is tied up with, re with rejecting it and bad-mouthing the legislation because there actually is a lot of positive in it, even for people at, as relatively conservative as Bill Frist. I, um, I don't know. Uh, I, we, I will just offer one uh, anecdote. Some of you may know that David Fromm, who is a speech, was a speechwriter for President Bush, is, ha, was at the American Heritage, or the, the Heritage Foundation in the U.S., and basically wrote a column saying that the Republican, his fellow Republicans had made a horrible mistake in opposing the legislation and uh, that they should have seized the opportunity to have bipartisan negotiations that was in fact handed to them. And indeed, the legislation follows the outlines of Massachusetts, which was put in place by a Republican governor, Mitt Romney, and a Democratic legislature. And everybody knows that, but now Mitt Romney has run as far away from it as he possibly can. Well, Fromm came out with this column, he was promptly fired from his position at the, at the Heritage Foundation. So people are in a take no prisoners mood in the Republican Party, and I honestly don't know uh, I, I cannot begin to forecast how they'll turn that around. Now, over time, I think this, this will amount to nothing, and all of us who watched the debate this year were highly amused when the notion of restraining the rate of growth in Medicare, which was a program that, of course, was opposed in 1965 because it was going to be the government takeover of health care. So now, restraining the rate of growth in Medicare was critiqued by the Republicans as being cuts in Medicare, that sacrosanct program, elect us as Republicans because we will keep the government out of your Medicare. <laughs> you know, uh, so over time I think, like most things, uh, and, and possibly 10 years from now, uh, all will be well and this system that we will have developed, re Republicans will then feel that they own as much uh, as they are attempting now to disown it. But it will be an interesting road in how we get to that change. So, well, I've enjoyed so much speaking with you today and look forward to coming back in a few years and we'll see if uh, we're having any better luck down there organizing a system that makes as much sense as so much of yours does. Thanks again. Thank